You're all aware that the rise of China is generally seen as a defining feature of the geopolitical landscape of the 21st century, and I know particularly those of you who are our master's students are, are well aware of that. But I think in the general media, everybody is well aware of the rise of China as the defining feature of this century. Those of you who um, follow the, the debate more closely will know that in Australia, um, it has centered around a couple of um, rather more extreme views, and I'm using shorthand here in terms of the time available. On the one hand, we have a view that um, uh, China already has primacy, and the United States should accommodate China um, and acknowledge that primacy, and that we should have second thoughts about our alliance with the United States. The other one is a lot more extreme, but you've seen it in the press and elsewhere in recent months. And that is that Australia should develop the military capability to tear an arm off China, and I can hardly keep my face straight as to what a quaint, ridiculous and dangerous proposition that is. And that line of thought also talks about us developing the capabilities to decapitate the Chinese leadership. Well, you know, really easy, isn't it? It's only a country of one point two billion people, piece of cake. Dangerous points of view. I have a different view. I see a China with serious weaknesses, and there are people here uh, who know a lot more about China than I do, and I stand here to be contradicted. Uh, but I think we're in the danger, and the, our American colleagues are in the danger of seeing China as the next Soviet Union, and demonstrably it is not in terms of military power. I'm also of the view, and this may surprise you, given America's uh, current economic uh, crisis, which is not to be dismissed, I think the United States is enormously innovative and inventive and dynamic society, uh, and I think it has enormous and tremendous reservoirs of power to bounce back. But again, uh, you could well uh, challenge me on that issue. So that's the sort of theme I I'm taking. I think it is time for a more measured and robust debate. I'm going to explore three things with you. First, and very briefly and very crudely, and I know many of you will be across the literature on this, and that is what are the competing theories about the rise and fall of great powers and, and the theories of what happens when great powers collide. Secondly, let's again very crudely look at some of the strengths and weaknesses of both the United States and China. And finally, I want to talk a bit about a pet topic of mine, and that is uh, what sort of regional security architecture will be best uh, to moderate these two giants, and can we envisage a regional security architecture that helps them to avoid uh, uh, conflict and um, confrontation. So that's the outline of what I'm about. So as to the first one, the theory is about the rise and fall of great powers. You all know that the traditional view about a rising new power like China uh, competing against a status quo established power like the United States. Historically, the historical record shows that such powers, a rising power, confronting an established power, <coughs> go to conflict. And the obvious model, of course, is uh, Germany in the Second World War and Imperial Japan also in the Second World War. You can think of many other examples, but like all examples in international relations, um, there are exceptions. And of course the exception that the historians often raise is that the United Kingdom did not go to war as the established power with the rising power, uh, the United States. And the explanation for that is often, well, they were both democracies. Um, and that the track record of authoritarian powers uh, is not so good at all. Some of you will have read the book over 20 years ago by Paul Kennedy, very famous book, The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers. It was published in the late 80s. His final uh, chapter was called The Coming Decline of the United States. And here we are over 20 years later and it hasn't yet happened. 
by the way, his penultimate chapter in which he footnoted the book I wrote on the Soviet Union extensively, he did not even see the limits to the Soviet Union that I saw. The essence of Kennedy's uh, thesis, as I recall it, was that at the absolute core of great power power is economic power. That gives you uh, military power and it gives you all sorts of other associated powers to do with your economy and its strength. And again you see, whilst one is attracted to that explanatory variable, whether it was the rise of Germany and Japan or the current rise of Japan in the 60s and 70s and China now, that economics explains it all, and you need a big successful economy. Let me put it to you, the Soviet Union did not have a big successful economy. It had a fragile centrally planned economy that poured 20% of its gross domestic product into the military. So you know that the exceptions always challenge the rule. Some of you may have read a book by Amy Chua. She's professor of law at the Yale Law School. It's called The Day of Empire, How Hyperpowers Rise to Global Dominance and How They Fall. And she has a particular definition of hyperpowers and she includes um, the Roman Empire, the Persian Empire, and particular aspects of the uh, Chinese Empire, I think, in the Tang Dynasty. Anyway, she has a interesting and quite difficult concept in which her explanatory variable is not economics. It's what she calls tolerance and intolerance. That successful hyperpowers are tolerant on the way up and intolerant on the way down. Well, you know, uh, I might put it to you that China right now is not one of the most tolerant of powers, and neither is the United States, so we've got a slight problem. Some of you will have uh, read the works by uh, Niall Ferguson. Um, in his 2010 Bernaithen lecture, uh, Empires on the Edge of Chaos, the Nasky Fiscal Arithmetic of Imperial Decline. He's, he argues that imperial falls are all, nearly always associated with fiscal crises, with sharp imbalance between revenues and expenditures, and above all, with the mounting cost of servicing, wait for it, a huge and rising public debt. Now here we have America right in that situation. And he makes the point that the Spanish Empire declined after the bill on its debt reached 100% of its annual ordinary revenue in 1598. Imperial France fell after interest payments reached 62% of annual revenue in 1788. Uh, Ottoman Turkey began its decline after interest payments on its public debt hit 50% in 1877. And now here comes Niall Ferguson's real point. The current United States debt is set to reach 146% of GDP by 2020, unless there is radical surgery. And the figure I hold in mind is, I think some of you know, the United States defense budget is about 700 billion US dollars, a non-trivial figure, and that the interest on America's public debt will exceed the absolute figure of the American defense budget by about 2015, unless something serious is, is done. And you see already there are some minor cuts in the American defense budget being talked about. And then we have some rather silly views. One Arvind Subramanian in the current September-October edition of Foreign Affairs, who argues that one day, sometime soon, China will control so much of American treasury bonds that it will demand that an IMF bailout is necessary as a precondition for the withdrawal of the American Pacific Fleet. Well, I don't know what areas of government he's ever worked in, but great powers, even on the way down, don't destroy their Pacific Fleet. It's called going to war, I'm afraid. But these are some of the sillier views we're getting. My view is that the 21st century will, obviously economics, GDP, geography, population are elements of power, but I think one of the defining variables will be high technology and innovation. Things like nanotechnology, biotechnology, and quantum computing. And in that area, the Americans are so far ahead of China right now, it's not funny. And the same applies in the military area, by and large. So let's move secondly to the strengths and weaknesses of China and the United States. 
And I say there are people in this room who know much more about China uh, domestic situation than me. China and the United States are two great continental powers. Large land area, large population. Both of them in different ways, historically, have seen themselves as exceptional, if not God-given. You're all well aware of America's description of itself as the exceptional country, the light on the hill. China, the mandate of heaven, the central kingdom, and so on. Moving to China, you will well know that it's only in the last 200 or so years, a little bit more, that China has not had the world's largest economy. The historical record that we have shows that before the era of European conquest of Asia in the 1500s, that China and India had the world's first and second largest economies. And it's only been since the European Industrial Revolution and the rise of America that that situation has been displaced. So for China, it's a short period of a, a hiccup in the period of uh, 3,000 years as a, as a unified state. The strength of China's economy is quite remarkable. The first time I went to China was in 1978 as Deputy Head of Defence Intelligence. I was a guest of the PLA at Foreign Affairs Bureau, so-called. And I remember going to Shanghai, that wonderful city on the Bund, and at Pudong, there was nothing. And I was the first Westerner to go on board a Chinese submarine and visit the submarine building yard in Shanghai. And you may well ask why. It was the beginning, three years after the Cultural Revolution, of opening up and some, frankly, military transparency in those days that is better than it is not now in China. The Chinese economy recently has overtaken that of Japan. Uh, as you well know, it's the second largest economy in the world. It's still a long way behind the United States. When the Chinese economy in gross terms will overtake that of the United States depends upon whether you use exchange rates or what's called purchasing power equivalent, what you get for your dollar. And some people are saying 2018, some people are saying 2025 or 2030. It doesn't mean to say, of course, the standard of living and the R&D and, if you like, economic throw weight will be the same. But we're living through, you're living through, a period in which the most remarkable transformation in the geopolitical balance is taking place based on this incredible openness of the Chinese economy since Deng Xiaoping started it in 1978. Compared with some other uh, great powers, uh, China is relatively homogeneous uh, um, in terms of its cultural makeup. It has a powerful vision of itself. Unlike the former Soviet Union, my personal view is you can't accuse the Chinese of not having a work ethic, demonstrably they do. Henry Kissinger, in his most recent book, published just a few weeks ago, called On China, it's marvellous, isn't it, when you get to Kissinger's status, you produce a book called, one word, Diplomacy. You produce a book in which his name is bigger than the title of the book <laughs> On China, I wish. Um, he talks in his first chapter about the singularity of, uh, of China. And for me, not being a China expert, it is an awkward chapter. He tries to explain the difference between the Western uh, concept of chess, which is conflict and winning, and the game which I can't remember in Chinese, but which in uh, Japanese is called no, go, um, and that the, the concept of winning and losing is much more sophisticated. Kissinger argues in this first chapter that unlike other historical empires that, that have come and gone, China boasts a unique history of cultural and political continuity, and that secondly, the foundation of this remarkable continu continuity lies not in violence or the use of force, but rather in an exceptional cultural heritage, the Confucian value system, which is aimed at domestic and global harmony rather than conflict. Well, that's an interesting proposition. And I find I've not fully read it or finished the book, but there are things where Kissinger is so pro-Chinese um, that based on the evidence, it's not accurate. And I can speak from personal experience. 
his chapter on when China taught Vietnam a lesson. Now that's an interesting phrase from a country that doesn't use force and isn't a, a hegemonic power. When China taught a fellow communist country a lesson and there are people in this audience who were with me in defense intelligence at the time. Kissinger argues that China won. No, it didn't. We watched the four um, Chinese uh, divisions come across. We watched them in detail, and we watched them try and beat a Vietnamese division, and they did not win. Kissinger has the same problem with the uh, division and uh, size battle on the Usuri River in Soviet Siberia, in which he claims the Chinese won, and I'm afraid the intelligence evidence that he surely has access to, it shows the opposite. Well, no book is, uh, is perfect. The issue of China's economy, when I talk to economic friends, I've got a particular friend called John Lee, some of you know, in the Center for Independent Studies. He wrote an article in, I think, the Financial Review recently, in which he talked about the structural imbalances the danger of a housing bubble uh, boom that would burst. He talked about the overinvestment in fixed investment for no particular purposes. And some people are arguing that rather than the Chinese economy just slowing from a mere 10% per annum, which it has grown by, give or take, for each year of the last 30 years, that it will slow to 7%, which is what is in the current Chinese five-year plan. Some people are arguing that it may peak and begin to slow or even stall. If it stalls as a result of this second round of the Western capitalist world global financial crisis, that we will all suffer, and by the way, not least this country. My information is that China's dem demographic situation is not brilliant. By 2015, the workforce in China will peak and start to contract because of the one-child policy. And by 2050, fully 450 million Chinese will be over the age of 60. Don't tell me there aren't geopolitical implications of that. Demonstrably, they are. And I won't go on about corruption in China, which Hu Jintao knows is a problem, environmental issues, and so on. But I will go on about something I know particularly well, and that's China's military. We're in danger of drumming up China as the next Soviet Union. And let me repeat once again, China now is nowhere near what the Soviet Union was at the same period uh, from its revolution. This is the 62nd year of the Chinese Revolution. In the 62nd year of the Bolshevik Revolution in 1979, the Soviet Union had 12,000 strategic warheads, nuclear warheads. How many does China have? 200. The Soviet Union had nearly 300 submarines. How many does China have? 60. 27 of those are obsolete, and one could go on at length. Um, it is not in the same ball game. But there is a danger, including the United States, as usual, that for the self-serving purposes of the Pentagon, there is an inclination to drum up uh, China as the next military power. I think China does have some capabilities. That wouldn't surprise me. Having suffered a century of humiliation, Having now got economic power, the amazing thing is that China didn't develop military power earlier. It was the fourth of the four modernizations until recently. And even now, the figures show that China spends more on domestic security, marginally, than on defense. Let's say the following things about China. Currently, in my view, it is a second-rate military power. It is nowhere near the American military power, so why should America accommodate it? in terms of there is no primacy. It has no experience of modern combat whatsoever. And let's not pretend that the Korean War and, the, uh, and uh, teaching Vietnam were lessons in um, modern combat. America's had year after year of modern combat experience. And whether you like it or not, Iraq, Afghanistan, the first Gulf War, Libya. The Pentagon report acknowledges that substantial parts of the Chinese military equipment is obsolescent, old Russian equipment. That it still reverses engineers much at Russian equipment. That after 30 years of trying, China can't even develop, after 30 years, a military jet engine, and it relies on the Russian military jet engines, which those of us who specialized in that subject knew only too well were high rate of wear engines. Chinese anti-submarine warfare is not in the same category as 
powers in the West. And, you know, I could go on a lot more. It is true that in cyber warfare, China has made important advances. It is true that in the capacity to target American aircraft carrier battle groups with ballistic missiles, it's making some remarkable progress. And you may want to raise in question time how America would react to being targeted by such a weapon system. America certainly would not sit back and fold its arms. So my view is uh, that China uh, still is a second-rate military power, making important progress in areas like ballistic missiles and um, cyber, but that it is not, and demonstrably is not, the former Soviet Union. The Pentagon report, report says that by 2020, it may be that China has a modern, regionally focused military capability, but of course it makes no measures against what the United States and its allies will have. It does acknowledge that China will be unlikely to project substantial military forces distance from China in the foreseeable future. However, and there are always howevers in uh, strategic affairs, there is no doubt, and this has to be acknowledged, as a result of the global financial crisis, America's reputation for leadership, as a result of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and by the way, America on and off has been in the Middle East now longer than it was in both the First and Second World Wars. Longer. And that the inability to decisively win in Afghanistan, and most particularly the global financial crisis, who would have believed 20 years after defeating Soviet communism that the United States would be now in this pickle of rampant capitalism out of control? And I think as a result of that, there is a perception that China is on the rise, and we've seen in the last 18 months to two years, China take some military-related advantage of this growing power. Its threats to uh, uh, Japan in the Senkaku Daoyu Islands, its uh, threats with regard to its core interest of owning the entirety of the South China Sea, its most recent challenge, only a few weeks ago, of an Indian amphibious ship leaving Vietnam. So there are some issues here about the rules of the game and norms of international behavior on the high seas. And I think there is a risk of an incident on the high seas. And if there is one, by the way, I know who will lose. And it won't be the United States. What about China's strengths and weaknesses in Asia? It has enormous strengths. Unlike America, it is located in Asia. It has 5,000 years of history in Asia. It has the sort of soft power influence that the former Soviet Union, for instance, never had. A, uh, a diaspora of overseas Chinese who um, uh, it looks to in terms of influence and uh, money in a way that the Soviet Union never had. And important contacts in Asia over many centuries. Some of those are contacts like its 1,000 year dominance of Vietnam that leads to uh, difficult relations. When you look at, however, at America's, at China's important friends and allies, who are they? Well, they are a country called North Korea, which is hardly one of the most brilliant, successful uh, countries in the world. A liability rather than something that you would like to have. Then it has Myanmar. Well, a country of no particular importance in Southeast Asia run by the military. And then it has Pakistan, which has been aided by China with regard to its nuclear capacity. And that's about it, isn't it? That is about it. So, no experience of modern combat, a second-rate military capability that is developing, and a bunch of allies that frankly don't amount to much. There's a slight exaggeration here, but I think you get the general point. But as our white paper of 2009 says, and I don't agree with everything that's in it by any means, as you'll hear me say in a minute, the Rudd white paper argues that by 2030, China will be the strongest military power in Asia and by a considerable margin. It then goes on to say that in the event that um, a major power adversary operates militarily against us in our northern approaches, we shall develop the military capability 
to impose substantial military costs on that power. There is another dangerous, ambitious capability that has not been thought through. Let's turn to the United States. Remember how I s said this is a country that sees itself as the exceptional power, the light on the hill. I think we Australians often uh, don't understand the Americans just because they speak a quaint form of English. They're an entirely different country in scale and origins from us, the Pilgrim Fathers, the role of religion, all those things that never occurred here in this society. But they do see themselves as exceptional. You saw that in the Monroe Doctrine and the Western Hemisphere. You saw that how that when they threw their weight eventually and late into the First World War, and more importantly late and eventually into the Second World War, they won. When we talk about democracies being careful about the use of military force, who dropped two nuclear weapons on Japan? The only time it's ever been done. Never underrate democracies when they get their temper up, and China should think about that. I don't agree with those in America who say that they saw the Soviet Union off, the Soviet Union saw itself off, and I'm going to talk about that in another public lecture on the 7th of November. But look at the strengths of the American economy. It's still the largest economy in the world, accounting for about 25% of world GDP. It accounts for half of world military expenditure. Let me repeat that. It accounts for half of world military expenditure, about 700 billion US dollars. China's expenditure, by the way, it claims, is 90 billion dollars. I've yet to meet any communist country that tells the truth about its defence budget, and let me tell you what the Chinese defence budget does not include. It doesn't include mili military procurement, it doesn't include military pensions, it doesn't include the armed militia and police, it doesn't include a whole bunch of things. So, what do we think, what does the Pentagon think that, uh, and the IISS in London think that China spends on military? About 150 billion. That's a long way behind the United States. If you want a figure that's my guesstimate, when you're looking at advanced military research and development, and I don't mean ordinary things, I mean the real high technology cutting edge stuff, do you know what percentage of world advanced military research and development America accounts for? How about 90%? Who are the others? Well, it ain't China and it ain't the former Soviet Union. There's a bit in, in the UK and there's a bit in uh, France and there's not a lot, lot else. Its demographics, unlike that of China, is not one of an aging population due to the one-child policy. It is a dynamic, youthful, growing population, uh, largely due to Latino um, uh, immigration and growth. Uh, and it's like that of no other great power except that of India. It too, like China, has an incredible work ethic, and I've stressed the issue of American innovation. Ask yourself, which have been the major successful world companies in the last three years? decades. They're all American. How about Apple, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, and you go on and on and on. Apple recently, momentarily, was the biggest capitalized company in the world. When you talk about the things I mentioned like biotechnology, nanotechnology, and quantum computing, uh, the Americans are really seriously in front in my view. Its weaknesses are obvious. Who would have believed they would have brought, in a self-fulfilling wish onto themselves, the collapse of larger elements of the economy due to what I can only call cowboy capitalism? The indulgence with regard to banks and financial institutions and things I don't understand like derivatives and so on. And they've brought that on themselves and I think the concern is is America going to pull itself out of this, what we call the GFC, the Global Financial Crisis, or are we bordering on another one? And if that happens, there will be some very serious geopolitical issues, which I'll come to at the very end. The question is whether these issues are enduring and abiding in the American economy, or whether, as in the past, they will bounce out of it, uh, as they did in the Great Depression. We will need to ask whether it will have a serious impact on the American military. At present, I don't, as a former defence planner, think that knocking $300 billion over 10 years is a big impost for America. That's the current issue. Works out at 5% of the defence budget. 
Given the waste in all defence budgets, Blind Freddy can save 5%. The question will become if the budget cuts cut harder. Kim Beasley, my former boss, who's now uh, um, our ambassador in Washington, as you know, was chancellor of this uh, eminent university, was in the Financial Review last week uh, in typical Kim fashion saying, um, never mind this uh, 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 closing gap between China and uh, American military capability, says Kimbo, the bomber, the gap is widening. America is racing ahead. And frankly, given his long security clearances at the highest level, that he and I shared for many years, he should know what's going on, but I haven't talked to him about it. What about America's strengths and weaknesses in, in Asia? We mentioned uh, China. America sees itself, and always has, since at least um, the wars with Spain and when it colonized, let's remember, the Philippines, uh, as an Asian power. But it is not of Asia. It's not in Asia in that sense. But it has a web of alliances and friends the like of which China simply does not have. And you remember I reeled off North Korea, Myanmar and Pakistan. Well, on the other side of the ledger, we have some of the world's other greatest successful economies. Japan, going through a long period of stagnation, still a very vibrant economy with a significant military. Japan, South Korea, the ASEAN countries, to a greater or lesser extent, they're either allies or friends of, of, of the United States. There is, in addition, from America's point of view, growing concern in some of those countries I've mentioned about growing Chinese assertiveness, the sort of things China's been doing in the Yellow Sea, the East China Sea, and the South China Sea. So what has happened? Japan, contrary to views that when a left-wing government came into power in Japan, it would move away from the alliance, it is moving closer. And things like Fort Tenma on, on Okinawa and the Marine Base uh, are being settled. South Korea has also, in my view, moved closer to the United States because of China's casual attitude to what its great ally North Korea did, sinking a, a South Korean warship and then shelling a South Korean island. By the way, in my book, Sinking a warship is an act of war that demands response. And, you know, I think South Korea has been enormously restrained. Even the ASEAN countries uh, of Southeast Asia, some in particular like Vietnam, are offering America use of facilities and bases. There are buying uh, Russian submarines, kilo class, very quiet, relatively speaking. Um, and they obviously decide in response to uh, uh, China. And you've seen that in other uh, acquisitions in our region. <coughs> the weaknesses of America, we all know. Its distractions in the last 10, year, 10 years, the since so-called 9-11, a phrase I hate, by the way. Its distraction fighting the so-called war on terror. Its wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, I've distracted it from the rise of China and the shift in the geopolitical balance. And what I now want to see is America refocusing. It, like us, is doing a forced posture review, which will have another look at the American bases at Futenma and Yokosuka in Japan, but there will be no pullout. There will be some reinvigoration of capabilities in Guam, and I expect you will soon hear some announcement uh, concerning greater American use of facilities in Australia. My view of the United States by 2030 is that it's still going to be the world's dominant power, the only power that has a global military capability. But if they continue to get their economy wrong, Paul Dibb is wrong. I suppose no matter what you think about my very rough hand uh, uh, description, my conclusion is that whether it's China, the rise and rise and rise, like no other power I've ever seen, or whether it's the United States, the decline, 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 that keeps being predicted and never happens, beware straight line extrapolations. We did it on the former Soviet Union, we did it on Japan, and we're doing it again on both China and the United States. So, thirdly, what sort of regional security architectures could we conceive of and that might be best 
to moderate these two giants, China and the United States, so they can live together in peace and harmony, or as the Chinese quaintly say, a harmonious country in a harmonious region in a harmonious world. Yeah, right. The big question of our time, and particularly the younger ones here who will be around to see what China looks like in 2050 or 2060 is. And it's a big question of our time. And not least for us in Australia, we're not parked off in Europe or across the Pacific in the United States. We're a small country with a small defence force located in Asia. And we've never in the past, in our short 200 year history, been faced with our major economic partner not being our major ally. Think about it. From 1788, uh, when the first fleet settled this country, through to when Japan attacked um, Australian forces in Singapore, we depended upon the United States for our military protection. And it was our greatest trade and investment. Power. By the way, the United Kingdom is still the second largest accumulative investor in Australia after the United States. And from 1942, when John Curtin said without regret that he returned now to the United States, we depend on the United States, which until a few years ago was our biggest economic overall trade partner, imports plus exports. Now, now we've got this uh, bifurcation. And uh, some are arguing that, that we will not be able to manage both things together. That is the crucial alliance with the United States and a growing and expanding economic relationship with China. So I guess to use an old farming expression, we'll have to straddle the barbed wire fence and, uh, and see if we can make it work without it hurting too much. But it's going to be very difficult, I think. The question of our time is, will there be a collision between these two powers? You remember the rising ambitious power that naturally needs its place in the sun, given the sad history of China in the 19th century and later, and the United States that has now been accustomed for a long time to being the world dominant power. You remember I said that history tells us, yes, there is a high risk of conflict. But perhaps I should not be so pessimistic. So, what moderated mechanisms geopolitically can we envisage? So there are three that I'm going to talk about, and there's one other that I should talk about, but I won't. And again, I'll be very crude. First of all, there's a traditional balance of power. The sort of thing that was successful in 19th century Europe under the Congress of Vienna, which by the way, Henry Kissinger wrote his PhD about. He's, until he wrote the book on China, he was a German geopolitical realist. He's now either lost the plot because of advancing years, or he's been bought. <laughs> the balance of power in which power is balanced between the powers, we had it in the Cold War. It was quite simple but dangerous between two powers, the Soviet Union, the United States, Warsaw Pact and NATO, or the sort of power we might be moving towards, a multipolar balance of power, particularly predominant with China and the United States, but with other major powers playing a substantial role. Obviously a rise in India, although it's a fair way behind China to say the least. A Japan that is damaged, but which you've heard me say, still has strong innovation and a significant military capability that we in Australia now are Japan's second most military relationship and we're going to do more. And there are other elements in the balance. You can talk about Russia, although I don't much these days, um, a power that's busted but which has a long history of bouncing back, but it's going to take a long time. It has some very serious deficiencies, which I won't go into, but you can ask about. Balances of power work if there is a common understanding about the risks and limits of power, and importantly, if one power doesn't appease, some would say accommodate, the other. Is there a concept in which the United States and its allies, including Australia, Japan, South Korea, which are essentially maritime countries, maritime allies, in which we're used to 
operating on the high seas and in which we have very advanced capabilities both above, on and under the water. So could you conceive of in this balance the United States and its allies as maritime allies? And on the other hand, and that's if you like the Washington Consensus, what's called the democratic free enterprise model of capitalism and democracy. And on the other hand, what's called the Beijing Consensus, the authoritarian state capitalism model, which has been very successful, and that might include China and Russia, who are members, by the way, of the Shanghai Cooperation Agreement, which, in my view, doesn't amount to much. It includes those two countries and the stands of Central Asia, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, and so on. Makes a very neat geopolitical little model, a bunch of uh, maritime uh, countries and a bunch of uh, continental countries. I wouldn't push that model very far because I think there are enormous hidden tensions between China and Russia that will not, uh, that relationship will not last very long. Are we already seeing alignments as China's power rises and as in recent couple of years it started to use power more and as people are getting more concerned, are we seeing already shifting alignments where countries such as Australia are taking a hedge against the risk of China's growing power? And I refer you to our defence white paper and what it said. And why do you think we might get under this government, and I don't know about the opposition because they don't have a defence policy. Why do you think we're going to double our submarine force to 12 as distinct from 6? Why do you think we would be building the world's biggest conventional submarines at closer to 5,000 tonnes than the Collins class 3,000? And why would it have air independent propulsion? And why would it have Tomahawk land attack cruise missile capable of targeting hardened targets at great distance in a, in a moderate way. Well, there's only one answer. Is Japan doing more in terms of its military capabilities? Yes, it is. It certainly was until the earthquake and tsunami uh, when I was in Japan talking to uh, people there about their military capabilities. Why do you think Japan is developing an anti-submarine warfare capability um, to detect Chinese submarines in the island chain uh, in the Okinawa Ryukyu island chain? Well, I think the answer is fairly obvious. What about other powers such as South Korea? Why is it acquiring submarines and air warfare destroyers with the Aegis air combat system on board? The world's most advanced American system for shooting down aircraft when you're on a ship. Well, it sure as hell isn't to fight some country called North Korea, in my view. So I say that we're already seeing alignment shift. Hopefully, if we are subject to a competitive balance of power, two things might ameliorate that that we haven't seen before. The first one is nuclear weapons and the risk of the use of them. And I'm perfectly convinced that the Chinese, like the Soviets before them, perfectly understand the risks of nuclear war. And that will be a limitation, hopefully, on any uh, military competition or, more dangerously, escalation. The second um, concept is one that one of my colleagues in favour of, a concert of power in Asia. Let me remind you, a concert of power in Europe was what happened at the Congress of Vienna in 1815. It arose out of the defeat of Napoleon's France. It brought all the major powers together. It did not humiliate France. And the boast is that the concert of Europe brought about peace for 100 years until 1914 and the First World War. Well, no, it didn't. I mean, if you care to put to one side the Franco-Prussian War between France and, and Prussia in 1870, more seriously, if you want to put to one side the Crimean War, in which, if you please, high Protestant England, Catholic France, and Islamic Turkey fought Orthodox Russia. And it wasn't a side war. 750,000 dead, 500,000 Russians. And despite the agreement of the Concert of Europe to not humiliate powers after battle, Russia was very much humiliated. The Black Sea feat was ordered to be destroyed. And as a result, Russia expanded into Central Asia and knocked on the door of Afghanistan, 
familiar, and grab Chinese territory in the Siberia, Russian Far East. There were geopolitical implications of the breakdown, as far as I'm concerned, of the concert of Europe. The, Cons the Congress of Vienna also was able to be formed because there was a common European culture, a common European understanding. Do I see a common nation culture, a common nation understanding, including on security matters? No, I do not. And what I do see in our region is rising nationalisms, edgy territorial claims and interests, and frankly, and my colleague Professor Desmond Ball has written about this, and Desmond is always careful on these issues, he now sees elements of arms racing in North Asia, it, particularly in the maritime, that is, naval and air warfare capability. I'm going to go on to the third one, but before I do, I would acknowledge that Many of my colleagues, and particularly in international relations, would say there is a fourth model, and that's called the economic interdependence model. But here we are in this globalized, economic interdependent world, not least in Asia, not least with America and China, you know, where are iPods assembled, not, not made, where are iPods assembled, where are iPads assembled in China, where it's almost everything assembled in China. That because of this, it would be disastrous if America went to war with China. And there's obviously some truth in that. But those of you who know your history will know that we heard that argument before. In 1911, a man called Norman, 1909, a man called Norman Angel wrote a book called The Great Illusion that said it would be disastrous for Germany that was so interdependent in economics, in trade, in immigration, in the royal family connections, in tourism. It would be disastrous for Germany to go to war with Britain. And guess what happened? But it is a legitimate argument uh, that needs to be considered. The final one I want to discuss um, is my favourite, a new regional security architecture. Well, we've got the alphabet soup of security architecture in Asia, and my God, don't we have it. We have APEC, we have ASEAN, we have ASEAN plus three, we have the ASEAN Regional Forum, we have the East Asia Summit, we have the six party talks, and it can go on and on and on. You might ask, how much progress has been made? Well, let me tell you. Gareth Evans, when he was foreign minister, he and I wrote a, a document called Confidence Building Measures for the ASEAN Regional Forum. And Gareth told me, in that typical way of Gareth, I couldn't use intelligence sharing. That was a naughty word. I had to talk about information sharing. I couldn't use the word transparency. And we proposed all sorts of things for confidence building. That was 18 years ago. ASEAN Regional Forum now is in its 18 years and it's still talking about it. I know because I'm a member of the ASEAN Regional Forum so-called expert and eminent persons group. And I've been on five of these meetings over five years. And in each of those meetings I proposed that we have an avoidance of naval incidents at sea agreement. Can I repeat that? An avoidance of naval incidents at sea agreement. In 1972, those arch enemies, the Soviet Union and the United States, had such an agreement. You know, you shall not point your missiles at, 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 at a proximate warship. You shall not train your guns. You shall not point laser beams and blind the people on the bridge. As a aircraft carrier or any ship with aircraft is steaming in a line that is crucial for the takeoff and landing, you shall not interfere. Soviet Union, United States. So for five years in the ASEAN Regional Forum Expert Men and Persons Group, I proposed that, and on each single occasion, the Chinese have knocked it back. And you know what the response of the Chinese representative is? Oh, that's not our priority, Paul. China's priority is primacy, is piracy, international crime, in my language, hugging trees. And my response to the Chinese Excellency is, so can you tell me why you're developing nuclear power attack submarines? Is that to do with piracy or international crime? You get no answer. So, you know, the problem is that uh, we're going nowhere with this one. And as my colleague uh, Des Ball says, we've got an arms race on our hands. Let me tell you what we've got. Unlike Europe in the Cold War, where there were arms control agreements, intrusive counting rules for ballistic missiles, including the factory gates, Americans at Soviet factory gates counting the ballistic missiles, intrusive rules for counting tanks, artillery, submarines, warships, 
we have no such agreements at all. But no open skies agreement, no avoidance of naval incidents at sea agreement. And that's happening, as Kevin Rudd pointed out in one of his first speeches as Prime Minister, this time he was right, that's happening while the arms race is building up. And it is not a very nice picture. It's one fraught with dangers and difficulties. I'm going to finish now, but before I do, while I'm talking about this concept of a regional security organisation, Henry Kissinger, in this book of his on China, 535 pages, beautifully written, beautifully written. He, um, in the last two and a half pages, he comes up with the idea of a Pacific community. So out of 535 pages, we get two and a half pages. Brilliant. Very well thought through. Not. And what's he talking about? Well, it's not very clear in two and a half pages, but that there would be a common enterprise between the China and the United States with shared purposes. It would not be a block, but it would be joint endeavours. Well, what the hell does that mean? I mean, if we're not getting anywhere with all these things I and others have been involved in 17 years, when we can't even get to first base about an avoidance of naval incident sea agreement, when there's nasty things going on in the South China Sea, the East China Sea and the Yellow Sea, then we've got a slight problem, Henry. But, you know, he floats it, two and a half pages out of 535. Good read, not. Okay, in conclusion, you can see I'm more optimistic about challenging the rise and rise of China. I think it has some weaknesses. And this might be the wishes of the father of the thought. I'm more optimistic about America bouncing back. But I recognize uh, I'm challengeable and may well be in the minority. But I am pessimistic, not optimistic, as you can see, about tempering what could be a dangerous competition between the rising power and the status quo power. And they're both ambitious, self-centered, uh, strong powers. So if I had a wish list, it would be to rapidly advance confidence building measures and arms, arms control measures, including intrusive inspections, to build up mutual transparency and conflict avoidance measures. However, we have been discussing for 11 years in the ASEAN Regional Forum, not just military confidence building measures, preventive diplomacy. And we now, after 11 years, have a work plan, a modest work plan for preventive diplomacy. And so you see, the risk is that the arms build up and the lack of transparency and uh, arms control measures is going to, we're going to run out of time. So, if we run out of time, we'll be left with, I'm afraid, the dangerous alternative, from my point of view, of the balance of power. Some will say it will be moderated by economic interdependence. I hope that's the case. Some, like me, will say that in the end it will be moderated by the fear of using nuclear weapons. Now, in case you think I've been very pessimistic, here's a really pessimistic note on which to end. I was at a, a conference two weekends ago called the Australian Davos um, Leadership Retreat. It's not Davos. And uh, I can't give you the names of who said what, but I can give you the gist of what our concerns were. There were very serious discussions in that meeting, but mainly businessmen and women and economists and a few of us security wonks. Very serious discussions about the state of the American economy, even more serious discussions about the state of the European Union economy, on balance, people were optimistic, but there wasn't a huge difference, you know, 60-40, optimism, pessimism. And I pointed out to the meeting, if Western democratic capitalism is in crisis, if it is, and we discussed, we had sessions, by the way, up on um, is there a crisis of capitalism? Um, if the West is in that crisis, and I hope it's not, then what I've said got to really uh, add very substantially to. Why? Because the last time in history that I recall where there was a serious global crisis in Western capitalism at the same time as there was a tectonic shift in the balance of power was in the 1930s and we all know how that ended up. Thank you.
This is our, our question seeking reassurance. Uh, suppose I was a uh, Vietnamese seeking reassurance from you that Vietnam sitting next to China will not go the same way as Mexico sitting next to America. Mm. Um, why is it that Australia would become like Ecuador, we should buy more Ecuador ships, bananas, <coughs> economic leverage is all. Um, can you give us the optimistic, perhaps counterintuitive no. answer to that? No, I don't. I, look, <laughs> Vietnam, a thousand years under Chinese suzerainty, as you well know, they've never forgotten that. And I can't remember whether you were here, Doug, but I was criticizing Kissinger's book in which the chapter which you should read on the Vietnam, uh, when China was teaching Vietnam a lesson, Kissinger claims China won. No, it didn't. Um, I think, you know, Vietnam, uh, it's, uh, I've been there a few times and helped develop um, what was called one and a half tracks for foreign affairs there in 96. It is a proud, nationalist, uh, successful uh, country that has saw off the French and the, and the Americans and how. Uh, I think the way they're buying Russian military equipment, not least submarines, Doug, tells us something. The way they're encouraging ship visits and maybe port rights by the Americans and certainly the Indians. It's, it's significant of this shift in alignment that, uh, where, where countries are reacting to what China's done in the last couple of years. As to Australia, well, we were the banana republic, weren't we? Um, I don't know whether we're um, Ecuador or Cuba or something, but I must say I don't buy the argument of some of my colleagues, Doug, says he carefully, that A, that um, uh, America, indeed its allies, should accommodate uh, 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 China. Accommodate starts to smack a bit, and I reluctantly use this word, appease. And secondly... I think we will have to run a dual policy, which will be enormously difficult, um, given that China is, and will be more so, our dominant economic power, and that America will remain uh, our ally. We will never have an alliance with China unless China becomes a democracy. I mean, for once, I actually agree with John Howard, who last week on TV said, it's values that separate us. It is values. Um, but I think a dual policy on Australia's part, which is carefully uh, modulated, um, which is engagement with China amongst the whole range of economic, trade, military, intelligence, cultural, human rights issues, but in which much more carefully than we said in the white paper, we have an element of hedging uh, with, along with our American ally is probably the way it's going to go. I think. Bill, did you have your hand up? Oh, I did. Um, I'm interested in your read on the flashpoints uh, of the Asian Pacific. Uh, uh, Balkans starting in World War One, Poland, or whatever. To, and, and Taiwan and the Korean Peninsula. Yeah. In, in, in particular, a lot of strategists are saying, well, China is actually actually being fairly concentrated in its development of uh, uh, naval capabilities in terms of uh, moving towards a position where it can test American power in some type of a future showdown in Taiwan. Uh, in terms of the Korean Peninsula, is uh, problematic as an ally, although we're trying to say the ally is as problematic as an ally as North Korea might be, nevertheless, seem to me to be pretty hard uh, to envision China standing by uh, if there's an implosion uh, of, of the North. Uh, and uh, uh, you have the same issue with the Americans of the Yalu or whatever. So yeah. I just wonder, I'd be very interested in your read of how the flashpoints problem figures in the overall power balance that you anticipate in the absence of confidence building measures. Yeah. I mean, I think the ones uh, that we've that have been very high profile recently um, in the South China Sea, the incidents I've mentioned, in the East China Sea, the incidents I've mentioned. Um, and, and even in the Yellow Sea, uh, when uh, China tried to uh, stop America deploying the aircraft carrier battle group, uh, George Washington, I mean, as if a great power is going to avoid doing that. Um, 
by the way, I, I might mention, because I haven't mentioned this, there is a, an interesting law of the sea difference between China and the United States. Remember that America is not a signatory to the law of the sea. Is that right, Bill? Yeah. They've not ratified it worse than the Western interpretation of law of the sea, and of course it's a Western uh, in model, not a Chinese one, is that countries have sovereignty in the 12 nautical mile territorial sea, but in the 200 mile exclusive economic zone, we, the Americans and allies, reserve the right to push our warships through without permission. The Chinese do not accept that, and that is going to be, and has been, I think, a big issue, particularly given their claims for the as far as we can see, the entirety of the South China Sea and the islands in any case and that generate 200 mile exclusive economic zones. To Taiwan, the latest Pentagon uh, uh, document released a few weeks ago points to the build up of the Chinese forces, particularly you know, a deluge of uh, intermediate range ballistic missiles which are, as I understand it, getting increasingly accurate and uh, combat aircraft. But its bottom line is that China still lacks the capability, uh, credibly, to mount a full-scale uh, assault on Taiwan. And it makes the very interesting point, which I underlined, Bill, that China does not have the ability uh, to mount a blockade of Taiwan's ports against a major power, against the United States. Again, you see, it tells you about the difference in the power situation. I mean, Taiwan is the issue that none of us want to, to face up to, frankly. I mean, we support the two-China policy. We don't want to crucify our relationships uh, with China on the... Um, is this mood lighting? <laughs> you know, on the relationship uh, that, uh, that we have with Taiwan. Uh, you know better than me that increasingly, it seems to me, the Chinese are, to be fair, have been very um, patient about Taiwan. They're no longer rattling the weapon system all the time. How many Taiwanese are working in China? Is it a couple of million? You know? Um, just across the straits, in factories that, you know, do all this high-tech stuff and so on. Um, so, you know, that's perhaps one where even I, Bill, would agree with economic interdependence being an inhibitor. The Korean Peninsula, I mean, you'd just wish that North Korea would go away, but for China, and you alluded to it, if North Korea should collapse like East Germany, by the way, the, West Ger the Western part of Germany is still getting over the costs, uh, as I understand it, of incorporating uh, the Eastern part, and the Korean thing would be much more expensive. A and the lack of interchange and so on, it's a, a totally different thing altogether compared with East Germany. That, if you're a Chinese, what you don't want is a North Korea that becomes part of South Korea, and don't tell me the South Koreans wouldn't love to have nuclear weapons. Yes, they would. We all know which the target would be, a place called Japan. Um, and that China does not want to see it, the risk of American troops, as you said, on the Yellow River. So the status quo, in many ways, as difficult as North Korea is, sort of works. A collapse of North Korea would be uh, hell let loose. Just coming back to Taiwan, I've often argued this in private, that, you know... If, if China attacks Taiwan, not because of a Taiwanese declaration of independence, because China's had enough patience run out to attack Taiwan, and American troops in and around Taiwan are being killed, and America invokes the ANZUS Treaty, believe you me, the ANZUS Treaty says, in the event of an attack on either of the high contracting parties, their territories, their troops, their aircraft and vessels in the Pacific area, we shall immediately consult. Doesn't say we shall necessarily do it. My concern has always been that we would be the only country that America could even look to to make, give assistance. Because the following countries would not be in a war between China and Taiwan. Japan, South Korea, all the ASEAN countries lined up together are not worth much in military terms in any case. Germany, I don't think so. France, I don't think so. Italy, I don't think so. And even the country I was born in, who loves a war, any war. <laughs> Remember the Falkland Islands? I think the Poms might say no, thanks. And where would leave, that leave us? On the barbed wire fence yet again. There's always Ecuador. I've got three, uh, three questions lined up. One, two, three, four. 
please. Um, Yoko Iwamawa, it's been uh, this year's visiting fellow here. I'm originally from Tokyo. Ah. Um, as a Japanese, I found it difficult to digest the first part of your presentation, which I found, I mean, all of it I found very um, fascinating, but it was about the danger of overestimating China. <coughs> yes, that's right. Put it yeah. that way. And the second part was about the importance of balancing China. Now, and your analogy of 1930s was also not very helpful. Um, what should have, I guess we're in that sort of position of Great Britain seeing um, Germany rising, but we are aging and declining power, although we do hold a, a very important international position still. So what should have UK done? Um, was Munich wrong? Should they have confronted Germany already in Rhineland? And, and, and our resources are limited. I mean, our being Japan? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Where should we put it in? That's going to be a very difficult choice because mm. we are aging and, uh, and all this cost of rebuilding after the tsunami. Um, you know, where, where should we put our resources? What's more difficult? How should we balance the you know, overestimation and uh, overcommitment and underestimation. Yeah. Here's a question for you, Professor. Uh, uh, dead easy. <laughs> You've got three minutes. Thank you. <laughs> I think it's very difficult for Japan, as you say, aging population, two decades of stagnation, so you've got two options. You can uh, accommodate and appease China, uh, which is effectively what uh, Britain and particularly France did with the Rhineland um, uh, in the Second World War. Um, uh, or, or you can uh, join a balance of power uh, with your great and powerful allies which is in fact what you're doing I mean you look at what you're doing with us we now have with you a, a military logistics resupply arrangement we're now discussing with your officials in Tokyo an intelligence sharing arrangement if we can trust your politicians by the way um, for, the f for the first time uh, in your history We've had our F-18 combat aircraft uh, using an airbase, I forget its name, uh, in your country. Uh, we've worked alongside you in uh, Cambodia, East Timor, and we guarded your troops uh, building a railway in Iraq. So I think we've come a long way. I don't underestimate the difficulties you face. I was in Japan, uh, as my family knows, the, the afternoon of the, of the earthquake in Tokyo. Do you know what was fantastic was the dignity with which your people uh, conducted themselves. Uh, there was no panic, none of that. Uh, the only thing that broke down was the mobile phone system, which was overloaded. I think, you know, that's going to divert you. It's going to cost 300 billion US dollars or whatever it is. By the way, as a proportion of GDP, that's less than the cost for New Zealand. You know that one. And um, certainly when I was talking at uh, vice foreign minister level, um, I think even with this left-wing government of yours, um, there is a desire to increase your military capabilities. You remember I mentioned the submarine detection capability, the SOSIS array, um, and the other things you're discussing. Um, what about anti-ballistic missile defence? How important do you think that is? I think for you it's important. I think, you know, the Patriot 3 and the Aegis system, uh, uh, the SAM-6s, the um, uh, are important and SM6s and uh, you should go ahead with that. I think it's very difficult for you because the in instinct could be, you know, just roll over and let it happen. And we all know what happens to countries that do that. I suppose we've got, we will finish on time because we'll have business and things to get to. It's almost 10 to 7. Uh, up here. Yeah, Dr John Blackson, there's TSC. Uh, Professor Dib, thank you for an excellent presentation. Thank you, neighbour. Always, always entertaining, I would say. <laughs> and uh, always you have some compelling arguments to make. You made an interesting observation about Arman's article in Foreign Affairs, the, the, the latest edition, which, uh, and your criticism of his conclusions, I think, are very reasonable. But he didn't address his argument in the body of his article, which I found reasonably compelling. He talked about um, the, the projection of uh, Chinese growth that perhaps reducing from 10 to 7 percent uh, and US economic growth it, it optimistically going from 2.5 percent to maybe if, you, if we're lucky 3.5 percent and even if that is the case at about 2030 China will still uh, outpace the United States. Um, 
that concerns me, obviously it concerns a lot of us, and, you, and you, in your presentation you talked about issues that you wouldn't consider uh, or that might, we might have to reconsider uh, if things change. I wonder if you could give us just for a couple of minutes your thoughts on how we might have to reconsider if that does happen. I mean, those figures, again, are based on, you know, um, an optimistic view of China's growth, and he claims they're moderate. Well, they're not moderate because they're the same as the central planning agency, the Politburo in China, which is based on 7%. Uh, my concern is that people like John Lee and, and others I know, David Hale in the United States, are saying there is a, a real risk that uh, China could have a... a, a, a dramatic slowdown, much more than 10 to 7 percent, if not some uh, so, sort of explosion in the housing boom and so on. And, you know, the answer to the people who do these extrapolations is, how good were we 10 years ago making judgments, you know? Uh, it, it's a useful discipline, by the way, including for intelligence people. When we're looking forward in defence planning terms 20 or 30 years ago, into the future, go back 20 or 30 years and see how many things we got wrong, you know, with the end of the Cold War, with 9-11, with Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, I mean, I do accept, who would have believed that uh, with the end of world history, as Francis Fukuyama called it, in which, you know, uh, the only uh, successful model was Western democratic capitalism, that would be in this sort of not just economic, but economic and political crisis in the West, leadership crisis. Um, I think the issues of what we would face if he is right, you remember his measures of the success of a great power were very crude economic ones. They were GDP, trade and debt. Well, he chose debt because it suited, you know. I mean, as, as long as America is a reserve currency, yeah, there's a problem with that sort of debt they've got, but they can actually just keep printing the, uh, the currency. So. We can speculate on, if he's right, then would everything that I've said be a lot worse, to which the answer probably is, like with the answer to Japan? Yes. Oh, my name is Albert Lee. I'm from the Department of Nuclear Physics. Um, Department of? Department of Nuclear Physics. Ah. <laughs> I just want to make a comment. Um, well, we all know that the four great, four great inventors of ancient China's compass paper printing and again power. And if you want to look at the parallels of those inventions in the modern world, so I think the forward inventions of the one the modern world are the aeroplane, yeah. um, the computer, yeah. the internet, and the nuclear bomb. Yeah. And I think if um, unless a country can take these four areas of invention to the next level, I don't think we can see a, a next place for power. I'll take that as a comment. Yeah. Yeah, are you doing things that we need to know about? <laughs> <laughs> well, the dean used to that. <laughs> it's another dean that has to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this will be our final question. Yeah, um, thank you very much, Professor Dick. I'm, I'm Gordon Hyde from the University of Houston for two years, Strategic Defense Studies Centre, which is here on the fourth floor. And I'm from Vietnam, and, uh, and I'm very impressed by your presentations. And um, I have a question from from the I mean, smaller countries' perspective, because uh, what we learn from history, I mean, Vietnamese history, the competition of powers is not good. Because anyone should have to choose side, and it's happened in Vietnam that yeah, the proxy war happened there, and yet yeah, tragedy happened. And we don't even after like you know hegemonic power as you know hundred thousand years before in the Vietnam history we have the Chinese the dominant power and Vietnamese people who live by the way that they make difference and one way that they recognize the 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 status of China as a the big power, big neighbor power, but then they try to keep autonomy inside. But the situation now is, is quite, you know, it's very hard for the policy you know, makers to decide whether they decide to, you know, in favor to sign up with China or US, or whether they have to, you know, sign up with, I mean, this sign up with ASEAN for a long time that couldn't prevent you know, China assisting in the South China Sea. And if you leave 
just near China is it's also a big puzzle for the policy makers all the time. So not only the, the pressures on the sea, but also pressure from different directions as well. Because just near the big power, also the economic relations as well, all type of relations have to depend on that. Mm -hmm. Is there any way out of that? Is there any way out of the geopolitical competitions? And if you are a leader, what do you choose? <laughs> You'd have to pay me a lot of money. <laughs> I think it's very hard, if I might say so, and I don't mean this in a. <laughs> I think it's very hard, um, if I might say so, for people like me who grew up. I grew up in in England, an island. I've lived here forty-five years or more. Anglo-Saxon countries in their origins are island countries, Britain, Australia, New Zealand, and even, you know, when you look at America, I mean, it's an island really, I mean, is Canada a threat? I don't think so. Is Mexico? I don't think so. And we've never had a history, certainly not Britain, Australia, New Zealand, of being invaded. I mean, the last time Britain was, was 1066. By the way, the last time the Americans was, was when we British set fire to the White House in 1812. <laughs> so we, we don't share long common but, uh, land borders where war has occurred. I mean, when I talk to Russians, they absolutely understand that. When I talk to Germans, they absolutely understand that. You understand it. A thousand years of uh, Chinese suzerainty, and despite being uh, fraternal communist countries in 1978, uh, uh, China decides to teach you a lesson. So I think the issue for you and your survival is the issue of middle powers. And I've mentioned, you know, South Korea, I've mentioned Vietnam, I've mentioned Australia, and by the way, I think in ASEAN, I'm glad to see, after almost an absence of 10 years, for reasons I understand with Indonesia preoccupied with building democracy, which it's doing in a way that Russia in the same period has absolutely not done, that in my impression at ASEAN meetings in the last two years, I'm seeing a more confident Indonesia, and I think that's good. We Australians certainly want to see the world's largest Muslim country, fourth largest democracy, just off our northern shore, have been more confident. And if I were you in ASEAN, although I know there are substantial weaknesses in ASEAN, I'd be doing more together, that is you in the north and Indonesia in the south, to try and get some more backbone into ASEAN. ASEAN talks a lot and doesn't do much. Finally, on South China Sea, there's not much you can do except do what you're doing with your kilo-class submarines and other military equipment, and frankly, prevail on the Americans, you won't need to prevail on them, to ensure that freedom of the high seas, including through the South China Sea, is a um, is a, an American interest because you can't do that by yourself. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in uh, thanking Paul for. Uh